Asanga people, today we'll be looking at the adrenal glands. We will be talking about uh, the glands themselves. I'll introduce you to dentalomas, cons and cushings and cancer. A bit about Edison's and finally few chromocytomas, but I forget. Papal does them. So, Weighing in at approximately 4 grams each, these retroperitoneal glands are situated at the upper poles of the kidneys within Gerauta's capsule. The right retroperitoneal gland is located between the right uh, liver lobe and the diaphragm, close to and partly behind the inferior vena cava. This one is the right one here. The left gland lies on the upper pole of the corresponding kidney and reaches the renal pedicle. It's said to be, you know, just slipping down the upper pole and here you can see that it's just almost reaching the renal pedicle. The left adrenal gland is covered by the pancreatic tail and the spleen. Uh, evident here, here is the spleen and here is your pancreas and your adrenal gland. And here you can see uh, the right gland uh, right behind the inferior vena cava. This cross-sectional view helps in visualizing the anatomy. As always, the anatomy is critical to the surgery of these glands. The adrenal or suprarenal glands are two endocrine organs in one, an outer cortex and an inner medulla, each with distinct embryologic, anatomic, histologic and secretory features. The cortex, this one here, forms from the mesodermal cells. Uh, while the medulla forms from the neuroectodermal cells which migrate here. So two distinct cell glands. The adrenal cortex is characterized by a zonal configuration. The outer zona glomerulosa contains small compact cells. The zona fasciculata can be identified by the larger lipoid cells arranged in a radial pattern. Here you can see this one. This one is your zona glomerulosa. And, uh, Compact and pigmented cells characterize the inner zona reticularis uh, visible here. The adrenal medulla consists of a thin layer of large chromosome fin cells which store catecholamine granules. The adrenal glands secrete mineralocorticoids, glucocorticoids, and the adrenal hydrogens and the catecholamines. I do know that you are very well aware of what all these hormones are doing. The mineralocorticoids, as the name suggests, manage the minerals, sodium and potassium in the body. Glucocorticoids are involved in numerous metabolic and immunologic effects including glucose and lipid metabolism, inhibiting immunological response, uh, affecting fat distribution, wound healing and bone mineralization, and causing euphoria or rarity depression. An incidentaloma is an adrenal mass detected incidentally by imaging studies conducted for other reasons not known previously to have been present or causing symptoms. Incidentalomas may be detected on imaging studies in around 1% of patients. When an incidentaloma is identified, a complete history and clinical, uh, clinical examination is required. Um, occasionally, a previous occult uh, endocrine disturbance will come to light. A biochemical workup for hormone excess and sometimes additional imaging studies are also needed. Uh, the main goal is to exclude a functioning or malignant adrenal tumor. More than 75 of these uh, percent of these tumors are non-functioning adenomas, almost 78 percent. But Cushing's adenomas, few chromocytomas, metastases, adrenocortical carcinomas, and Kohn's tumors can all be found this way. Investigating an incidentaloma include uh, serum electrolytes, morning and midnight plasma cortisol measurements. We know cortisol secretion is a diurnal variation, androgen levels, and free metanephrines. 24-hour urine specimens measure catecholamines, metanephrine, which is the most specific test for a few chromocytoma and VMA for medullary tumors, while cortisol and ketosteroid levels are useful for adrenal cortical tumors. If a pheochromocytoma is suspected, a clonidin suppression test or a glucagon stimulation test can be performed to confirm the diagnosis. Cross-sectional imaging such as CT seen here or an MRI should be perform performed in all patients with adrenal masses. The likelihood of an adrenal mass being an adrenocortical carcinoma increases with the size of the mass. So there's a 25% 25% likelihood of a tumor 
being malignant if it is greater than 4 cm. Adrenal metastases are likely in the patient with a history of cancer elsewhere and the sole indication for biopsy of an adrenal mass is to confirm a suspect, suspected metastasis from a distant primary site. Here you can see the normal adrenal glands, arid ones, this one is the left one and here is the right one. A word of caution for biopsying adrenal masses. Always exclude a pheochromocytoma first as release of catecholamines by the intervention may trigger a severe hypertensive crisis. Here we can see a, a, an adrenal mass being biopsied under imaging. Any non-functioning adrenal tumor greater than 4 cm in diameter and smaller tumors that increase in size over time should undergo surgical resection. Non-functioning tumors smaller than 4 cm should be followed up after 6 monthly intervals up to 24 months by imaging and hormonal evaluation. Remember we want to see if it is hormonally active and if its size is increasing. So if the tumor remains non-functioning and stable in size, surveillance can be discontinued. Repeated frequent imaging using ionizing radiation can lead to dangerous exposure, exposure to radiation and should be avoided. A repeated MRIs with contrast also risk uh, toxicity due to the contrast itself. We come to primary hyperaldosteronism. It is defined by hypertension, hypokalemia, and hypersecretion of aldosterone. In PHA, plasma renin activity is suppressed. Among patients with hypertension, the incidence of hypokalemic PHA is approximately 2%. Recent studies have revealed that up to 12% of hypertensive patients have PHA with normal potassium levels. Thus, potassium levels are an inconsistent diagnostic feature of this disease and cannot be relied on to confirm or exclude it. The most frequent cause of a PHA with hypokalemia is a unilateral adrenocortical adenoma. This is called a Kohn's adenoma and the syndrome is a Kohn syndrome. In 20 to 40 percent of cases, bilateral micronodular hyperplasia is causative. Now, rare causes of PHA are bilateral uh, macronodular hyperplasia, glucocorticoid suppressible hyperaldosteronism, or an adrenocortical carcinoma. In the subset of patients with normal clinic PHA, 70% have hyperplasia and 30% are unilateral adenomas. Here, you, this is a Cushing's adenoma, this one here, oh sorry, a Kohn's adenoma of the left adrenal gland and you can see that this is the normal shaped adrenal gland itself. Now, most patients are between 30 and 50 years of age uh, with a female predominance. Apart from hypertension and hypokalemia, patients complain of non-specific symptoms such as headache, muscle weakness, cramps, intermittent paralysis, polyuria, polydipsia, and nocturia. Here we see a classic uh, canary-colored Kohn's adenoma. The key feature of the biochemical diagnosis is the assessment of potassium level number one, but as we said, they are not very reliable. And the second one is the aldosterone to plasma renin activity ratio. Antihypertensive and diuretic therapy which cause hypokalemia and influence the renin angiotensin aldosterone system have to be discontinued. Once the biochemical diagnosis is confirmed, MRI or CT scans should be performed to distinguish unilateral from bilateral disease. Kohn's adenomas usually, usually measure uh, between 1 to 2 centimeters and are detected by CT with a sensitivity of 80 to 90 percent. Microdontal changes and small adenomas are often underdiagnosed, um, but thin cuts uh, CT scans do improve the localization. Here we can see a Kohn's adenoma. Now, an apparent unilateral mass could be a non-functioning tumor in a patient with bilateral micronodular hyperplasia. Therefore, selective adrenal vein catheterization is warranted before a decision on non-surgical or surgical treatment is made. During selective adrenal vein catheterization, samples are obtained from the vena cava and from the both adrenal veins and the aldosterone to cortisol ratio is determined in each sample. A significant difference in the ACR ratio on one side indicates a unilateral disease. So one is here and this is taking the sample from the left adrenal gland and from the right side from the right adrenal vein. There is a little bit of a problem once you are doing 
uh, adrenal vein catheterization especially on the right side the left side is easily cannulated but on the left side we do have problems because of number one multiple veins or the vein is small in size now the first line therapy for PHA with bilateral hyperphtasia is medical treatment with spironolactone in most cases supplemental antihypertensive medication is necessary in a patient who does not respond to generally uh, to ordinary antihypertensive such as we generally we start off a patient with uh, a calcium channel broccoli but if he responds very well to spironolactone then a suspicion of a PHA should also be uh, entertained now unilateral laparoscopic adrenalectomy is an effective therapy in patients with clear evidence of unilateral or asymmetrical bilateral disease a subtotal resection is favored in the case of a typical constant adrenaloma adenoma in 10 to 30 percent of patients who undergo an adrenalectomy hypertension persists despite adequate diagnostic workup and treatment though at a lower level and uh, requiring uh, fewer drugs uh, to control it Hypersecretion of cortisol caused by endogenous production or excessive use of corticosteroids is known as Cushing syndrome. It can be either ACTH dependent or ACTH independent in origin. The most common cause in 85% of patients of ACTH dependent Cushing syndrome is Cushing's disease resulting from a pituitary adenoma that secretes an excessive amount of ACTH. In about 15% of patients, an ACTH independent Cushing syndrome, where there is low levels of ACTH, is caused by a unilateral adrenocortical adenoma. Adrenocortical carcinoma and bilateral macronodular or micronodular hyperplasia are rare causes of hypercortisolism. Ectopic ACTH producing tumors such as small cell lung cancer, forget carcinoids, and corticotrophin releasing hormone producing tumors such as medullary thyroid carcinoma, neuroendocrine, or pancreatic tumors are more infrequent causes of ACTH dependent Cushing syndrome. The clinical features are well known with weight gain and central obesity and diabetes, hypertension, skin thinning, um, muscle weakness, osteoporosis and hypokalemia. Moon faces, a bull, buffalo hump and abdominal stria are other striking features. Here you can see the um, stria, thin skin, the bruising, easy, easy bruisability. Now elevated or normal ACTH levels provide evidence for an ACTH producing pituitary tumor that is present in 85% as I said or ectopic ACTH production. Therefore in patients with an elevated ACTH, MRI of the pituitary gland must be performed. If MRI is negative and additional venous sampling from the inferior petrosal vein that is in the brain has excluded a pituitary microadenoma, a CT scan of the chest and abdomen is warranted to detect an ectopic cortisol producing tumor. In patients with suppressed ACTH levels, a CT or MRI scan is performed to assess the adrenal glands. Subclinical Cushing syndrome is diagnosed if clinical symptoms are absent in the face of abnormal cortical secretion. In short, ACTH levels dictate which area to scan. Here we see a bilateral asymmetrical hyperplasia of the adrenal glands in a patient with uh, Cushing syndrome. The right trend is a little bit larger than the left one. Medical therapy with metoclopramide or ketoconazole reduces steroid synthesis and secretion is in, and is used in patients with severe hypercortisolism or if surgery is not possible. ACTH producing pituitary tumors are treated by a transphenoidal resection or radiotherapy. If an ectopic ACTH source is localized, resection will cure the hypercortisolism. A unilateral adenoma is treated by an adrenalectomy. In cases of bilateral ACTH independent disease, bilateral adrenalectomy is the primary treatment. Patients with an ectopic ACTH dependent Cushing syndrome and an irresectable or unlocalized primary tumor should be considered for bilateral adrenalectomy as this controls the hormone excess. Subclinical Cushing syndrome caused by a unilateral adenoma is treated by a unilateral adrenalectomy. Patients with Cushing syndrome are at an increased risk of hospital-acquired infection and thromboembolic complications and myocardial complications as well. Therefore, um, prophylactic anticoagulation and the use of prophylactic antibiotics are essential. Cushing-associated diseases uh, such as uh, diabetes and hypertension 
must be controlled by medical therapy preoperatively. Um, supplemental cortisol should be given after the surgery. In total, around 15 milligram per hour is required periodically uh, for the first 12 hours, followed by a daily dose of 100 milligram for three days, which is gradually tapered off. So you taper off the steroids. After a unilateral adenectomy, the contralateral suppressed gland needs up to one year to recover. Adequate function. In 10% of patients with Cushing's disease who undergo a bilateral adenectomy after failed pituitary surgery, the pituitary adenoma causes Nelson syndrome and due to a continued STTA secretion at high levels causing hyperpigmentation as a result of chemical synergies between ACTH and melanocyte stimulating hormone. Nelson's. Okay. Now, adrenal cortical carcinoma is a rare malignancy with an incidence of one to two cases per one million population per year and a variable but generally poor prognosis. A slight female predominance is observed 1.5 to 1. The age distribution is bimodal, so we have one mode and this one to one. And the first peak is in the childhood and the second peak is at the fourth and fifth decades. This is an adrenocortical tumor here. Uh, which caused uh, Cushing syndrome and viralization in a female patient and this is an MRI which shows us the tumor again on the left side. Approximately 60% of patients present with evidence of steroid hormone excess which is Cushing syndrome. Patients with non-functioning tumors frequently complain of abdominal discomfort or back pain caused by the large tumors. However, an increasing use of abdominal in imaging, a growing number of adrenocortical carcinoma are detected incidentally. Adrenal tumors secreting more than one hormone in excess or feminizing masculinizing steroids are likely to be malignant. The diagnostic workup should include the measurements of uh, DHEAs, cortisol and catecholamines to exclude a few chromocytoma and a dexamethasone suppression test. MRI and CT are equally effective in distinguishing adrenocortical adenoma from carcinoma. MRI angiography is useful to exclude a tumor thrombus in the vena cava, which must be excluded uh, before an adrenalectomy. As distant metastases are frequently present, a CT scan of the lung is uh, recommended. The WHO uh, classification uh, is based on the McFarlane classification, classification which uh, defines four stages. Uh, stage 1 is uh, tumors less than 5 cm. As this tumor size increases, this stage is 2 for those greater than 5 cm. Locally invasive tumors are grade th stage 3 and tumors with distant metastases are as always stage 4. Now, complete uh, tumor uh, resection, which is an RO resection, is associated with a favorable survival and should be attempted whenever possible. In order to prevent tumor spillage and implantation metastasis, the capsule must not be damaged. Unblocked resection with removal of locally involved organs is often required and in case of a tumor thrombus in the vena cava, the assistance of a cardiac surgeon is sometimes needed. So, if you have a tumor here, um, sorry, we were here. If you have a tumor here and uh, you want to, this is a part of uh, the lymph nodes, and you've got the uh, kidney here, and you want to do an and block resection. Now, laparoscopic adenectomy is associated with a high incidence of local recurrence and cannot be recommended. Um, tumor debulking plays a role in functioning tumors to control the hormone excess. Uh, for example, if it is involving the inferior vena cava, you cannot remove it and you just debulk it so that at least uh, the hormonal excess is controlled. Patients should be treated with uh, postoperatively with the uh, mitotain alone or in combination with the topside, doxorubicin and cisplatin. Actuate radiotherapy may reduce the rate of uh, local recurrence. After surgery, uh, restaging every three months is required as the risk of tumor relapse is high and prognosis depends on the stage of the disease and the complete removal of the tumor. So patients with stage 1 or 2 disease, uh, that is tumors 5 and more than 5 have a 5 year survival rate of 25%, whereas patients uh, in stage 3 with the local involvement and stage 4 distant metastases have 5 year survival rates of just 6%, 0% respectively. 
we come to primary adrenal insufficiency it's caused by the loss of function of the adrenal cortex it was first described by thomas edison in 1855 an early diagnosis is a clinical challenge even today symptoms are only evident when about 90 percent of the adrenal cortex is destroyed a secondary adrenal insufficiency is defined as a deficiency of pituitary acts secretions and the tertiary uh, um, adrenal deficiency is uh, provoked by a loss of the hypothalamus CRD secretion and is caused by either therapeutic glucocorticoid administration, a brain tumor or a radiation. So um, primary adrenals, secondary the pituitary and the tertiary is the hypothalamus. Now these diseases in this this long list they result in destruction of the adrenal glands with a resultant uh, insufficiency of the adrenal hormones now acute adrenal insufficiency usually presents as shock in combination with fever nausea vomiting abdominal pain hypoglycemia and electrolyte imbalance the waterhouse uh, friedrichsen syndrome is a bilateral adrenal infarction associated with meningococcal sepsis here you can see in this patient this meningococcal rash here and is rapidly fatal unless immediately treated. Because of the intestinal symptoms and fever, the so-called uh, uh, Edisonian crisis is often misdiagnosed and an acute abdominal as an acute abdominal uh, condition. When symptoms develop over time, patients present with severe anorexia, weakness, and nausea. As a result of negative feedback, ACTH and pro opiumelanocortinin Level levels increase and cause hyperpigmentation of the skin and mucosa. Hypotension, hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, and hypoglycemia are commonly observed. Here we see hyperpigmentation on the extensor surfaces, on this skin creases in the hands, and the plaques on the guns. Some patients have uh, a vitiligo and hyperpigmentation, as is seen here, vitiligo and then hyperpigmentation. The diagnosis of adrenal insufficiency is made using the ACTH stimulation test. Basal ACTH levels are found to be high with cortisol levels decreased. There is no rise in cortisol levels following the exogenous administration of ACTH, which is also known as the um, synactin test. So, a synactin test. If a patient uh, displays features of adrenal insufficiency, treatment must be instituted immediately before the biochemical diagnosis. Initial blood samples can be used for later determination of ACTH and cortisol levels. In addition to intravenous administration of hydrocortisone, 100 mg every 6 hours, 3 liters of normal saline is given in 6 hours under careful cardiovascular monitoring. Concomitant infections which are frequently present uh, and require aggressive antibiotic treatment. Chronic adrenal insufficiency is treated by replacement therapy with daily, daily oral hydrocortisone 10 mg per square meter of the body surface area and fludrocortisone 0.1 mg. Patients must be advised about the need to take lifelong glucocorticoid and mineralocorticoid replacement therapy. To prevent an Edisonian crisis, patients must be aware of the need to adjust the dose in case of illness or stress. If patients with adrenal insufficiency are scheduled for surgery, appropriate steroid cover uh, must be administered. Now we come to the surgery itself. Electroscopic or retroperitoneoscopic adrenalectomy is the gold standard in the resection of adrenal tumors, except for those tumors with signs of malignancy. As we said, we don't want the seating. The laparoscopic uh, transperitoneal approach offers a better view of the adrenal region and, and is easier to learn, as most surgeons are familiar with the transperitoneal view. But the advantage of the retroperitoneoscopic approach is the minimal dissection required. You just go right into the place where it is, where the adrenal glands are. And since this is an extra abdominal procedure, in the case of small bilateral tumors or in patients with hereditary tumor syndrome, a subtotal resection is warranted to avoid steroid dependence. The mortality rate ranges from 0 to 2 percent in specialized centers. An open approach is considered if radiological science, distance metastasis, and large tumors that is greater than 8 to 10 centimeters or a distinct hormonal pattern suggests a malignancy.
The surgical axis in these cases is usually a thoracoabdominal one. Here you can see this is the abdominal tumor, as uh, the adrenal tumor, the inferior vena cava, and the adrenal vein. Knowledge of the anatomy of the adrenal region is essential as anatomical landmarks guide the surgeon during the surgery. If these landmarks are respected, injury to the inferior vena cava or renal vein and the pancreatic tail or the spleen can be avoided. Careful hemostasis is essential as small amounts of blood can impair the surgeon's view. To prevent tumor spillage, a direct grasping of the adrenal tissue or tumor has to be avoided. The patient is positioned uh, right side up in this right case with the table broken. So the table is broken like this. Now three ports are used to start off. In this one you can see one, two, three, but four. They, we, they've added a fourth one. So the peritoneum is divided two centimeter below the edge of the liver. The liver is really retracted up and off the adrenal gland. The gland is identified and mobilized gently and the vein is secured with a clip here. You can see a clip being applied to this vein and this is the liver here and this is the adrenal uh, tumor. And the gland is removed in a plastic uh, uh, bag. Now for the left uh, adrenal, uh, adrenalectomy, uh, the position is the mirror image of the right adrenalectomy. It's the same thing, but the left side is up with the treble broken. Uh, the incision in, uh, of the garrotus fascia is then followed by identification of the adrenal vein, uh, which uh, runs into the renal vein in the space between the medial aspect of the kidney and the posterior aspect of the pancreatic tail. So you can see this is the pancreatic tail and this is the kidney here and this is the inferior uh, in the uh, adrenal vein. The resection is completed by mobilizing the adrenal gland at the level of the periadrenal fat. The spleen and pancreatic tail in this view have been mobilized uh, to and detector enterometrally to expose the adrenal gland. The cleft of the open book, this is a book here and this is like this and, and it's developed from the superior to inferior direction to identify the inferior phrenic vein and the adrenal vein. For a retroperitoneoscopic uh, approach, the patient is placed prone. Note the bolsters and the compression devices on the legs here which are so to prevent uh, thrombolism. Now, the first port is placed at the distal end of the 12th rib with the patient uh, in this prone position. Here is the 12th rib and the first port, second port and the third port. After a digital dissection into the, into the retroperitoneum, the garrotus fascia is displaced ventrally. The left adrenal vein is usually located at the medial inferior pole of the adrenal gland. Here you can see the left adrenal vein. This is the left adrenal vein and then we put the inferior vena uh, phrenic vein joined together to drain into the left adrenal vein. The right adrenal vein is covered by the retrocaval posterior aspect of the adrenal gland. And you can see this vein very, very clearly here. This is the, inferior, uh, the adrenal vein. This is the IVC and we put this tumor here. Okay. Now, high inflation pressures in this allow a blood dust dissection. You can see no blood in this one. Uh, effectively, basically, they're tamponading the veins. And being outside the abdominal cavity affords an excellent uh, view. So there is less uh, fogging. Now, an open adrenalectomy is almost exclusively performed when a malignant adrenal tumor is suspected. So the patient is here. The patient is tilted towards the opposite side. On the right side, the hepatic flexure of the colon is mobilized and the right liver lobe is uh, mobilized, uh, retracted cranially to achieve an optimal exposure of the IVC at the adrenal gland. So this is the IVC. It's important to always uh, visualize and obviously safeguard the IVC. And here is the adrenal gland with its tumor. On the left side, the adrenal gland uh, can be exposed after mobilizing the splenic flexure of the colon through the transverse mesocolon or through the gastrocolic ligament. Here we have it open through the gastrocolic ligament. So this is the stomach and this is the colon. The gastrocolic ligament is ex exposed. The remaining dissection is the same as in laparoscopic adrenalectomy. A resection of regional lymph nodes is performed in malignant uh, adrenal tumors and includes resection of the tissue between the renal pedicle and the diaphragm. So this concludes uh, 
the lecture on uh, the on, on the surgery of the adrenal glands. Um, any questions are welcome, and uh, I hope uh, you have learned something today. So, Allah Hafiz, and stay safe.